In March 1965, the United States began a bombing campaign in North Vietnam, a campaign deliberately limited to encourage peace negotiations and to prevent confrontation with the Soviet Union and China. But Hanoi was not interested in peace negotiations, and neither Moscow or China wanted a confrontation with the Americans. In fact, afraid that a North Vietnamese victory would increase China's power and prestige, Moscow would offer Washington advice on how to defeat Hanoi. This is the story of how decisions in Washington united America's divided communist opponents, while producing an air campaign that was doomed to become a costly failure. No replacement in sight. In Saigon on January 6, 1965, the army had handed political control to a provisional civilian government, led by Chan Van Huang. However, some of the generals were soon working with Chi Quan and the militant Buddhists to subvert the new government. Also on January 6, William Bundy handed Dean Rusk a memo before he met with President Johnson. He had concluded, along with Forrestal and McNaughton, that stronger action in South Vietnam would put the US in a better position to hold the line against communism at Thailand. General Horn then made a deal with the militants. The army would remove Huang and take over the government, and in return for allowing them to do as they pleased, the militants would support the new government for at least two years and send Chi Quan out of the country. Han led a bloodless coup on the morning of January 27th with the assistance of General T and Air Marshal Nian Kao Ki. Assured Han would leave politics after a 20-man advisory group appointed a civilian head of state, the Armed Forces Council replaced Wong with Han. Some of the generals opposed the collaboration with the militants and sentiment among them for their complete suppression increased. President Johnson met with key Democratic and Republican members of the House and Senate on January 21st. At the end of the meeting, Johnson stated that more US troops are not needed in South Vietnam, short of a decision to go to full-scale war. Events in Saigon led to a change in policy in Washington. Taylor, the GSCS and some leading civilians, had been pleading with President Johnson to take immediate decisive action, rather than wait for a good government in Saigon. Until the fall of ZM, Taylor wrote, I doubt anyone appreciated the magnitude of the political forces kept under control by his iron rule. There is no adequate replacement for ZM in sight. McNamara and McGeorge Bundy reached the same conclusion on the 27th, and McNamara used his influence on Johnson to take action. Johnson then dispatched Bundy to Saigon to consult with the embassy on the action required. Needing an incident to justify the use of military force, on January 27th, Johnson authorised the resumption of DeSoto patrols in the Tonkin Gulf, which had been suspended in September, and the next day General Wheeler ordered Sharp to resume the patrols on February 3rd. Bundy presents his plan. Bundy arrived in Saigon on February 4th, and spent the first few days developing a plan with Taylor for the sustained bombing of North Vietnam. On February 7th, the Viet Cong attacked Camp Holloway, killing seven Americans and wounding more than 100. Bundy reported to Washington that the country team recommended retaliatory airstrikes, and an NSC meeting also favoured retaliation, with the exception of Senator Mike Mansfield, who was concerned reprisals could spark a confrontation with China. Johnson had committed himself to a response to the next attack on American forces or facilities in a January 6 meeting with Rusk, McNamara and Ball, and he approved the weakest of three airstrike plans. The plan was executed on the afternoon of February 7th as Operation Flaming Dart. Soviet Prime Minister Kosygin would later write that The North Vietnamese launched their offensive just when Kosygin was in Hanoi. They were doing their utmost to foster enmity between Moscow and Washington. Later that day, Bundy left Saigon, and returning to Washington, he presented his recommendation for a long-term bombing campaign against North Vietnam to President Johnson. His plan consisted of sustained strikes which could be justified as reprisals for Viet Cong activity. The bombing would increase or decrease in intensity based on the scale of Viet Cong attacks, and if the Viet Cong failed to reduce its offensive, US bombing would gradually increase, without reaching full capacity in order to maintain the threat of worse to come. But eroding Hanoi's will was a secondary and long-term objective. The principal purpose of the plan was to demoralise the Viet Cong and increase support for the Saigon government, as previous inaction had undermined confidence in the US and Saigon. Bundy estimated that his plan had a 25-75% to 75 chance of changing the course of the war. The prospect in Vietnam is grim, he stated. On February 8th, 
McNamara asked Wheeler to develop an eight-week program of pre-planned airstrikes against North Vietnam, with no more than two to three attacks per week. The JCS submitted its plan for an eight-week program for the air campaign to McNamara on February 11th. US and South Vietnamese aircraft would attack four fixed targets, and air interdiction missions would target two road segments per week. President Johnson approved the air campaign against North Vietnam on February 13th. There was agreement on the need for sustained bombing of North Vietnam, but while John McCone believed bombing could in fact erode the will and capability of Hanoi to act, he wanted a much faster pace than Bundy's plan dictated. Johnson preferred the slower initial tempo. He shared Bundy's view that air power could not seriously affect Hanoi, and a slower tempo also appeared to involve a lower risk of war with China. Army Vice Chief of Staff General Bruce Palmer stated to McNamara in a February 11th memo that The Army did not agree that bombing North Vietnam could produce the desired result, and the Navy wasn't too sure about it. It was the Air Force and the Marine Corps that were tough proponents of air power. In a meeting at the White House on February 17th, former President Eisenhower was briefed on the situation, and he remarked that the first duty was to contain communism in Southeast Asia. Bombing could help achieve that objective, but the time had come to shift from retaliatory strikes to a campaign of pressure. The JCS issued the execute order for Rolling Thunder 1 on February 18th, but due to poor weather, an attempted coup in Saigon, and a communist conclave in Moscow, it was delayed until March 2nd. On February 20th, the Armed Forces Council voted to unseat Han as Commander-in-Chief, and on the 25th he left South Vietnam for the US and Europe with the role of Ambassador at Large. Rolling Thunder begins. Had the Americans known that Hanoi's strategy had in fact changed, Washington might have been encouraged to target the flow of logistics required for a conventional offensive in the South. But due to poor intelligence in the first months of 1965, the Americans were not aware of the presence in South Vietnam of the NVA 325th Division until April. This inadequacy of US intelligence also affected the decision not to send ground forces to South Vietnam. The Americans believed the Communists would continue to rely on small attacks, which it believed South Vietnamese ground forces could defeat. While Westmoreland and the JCS did argue for the introduction of US ground forces after the attack on Camp Holloway, they were aware of the opposition in Washington to such action, and the generals proposed using ground forces to protect American assets in the South, most importantly the air base at Zanang, believed to be threatened by 12 Viet Cong battalions. On February 26, President Johnson agreed to send two US Marine battalions to Zanang. The battalions were scheduled to arrive on March 8th and had the mission of securing the airbase. Taylor had urged the rejection of Westmoreland's request. Once you put that first soldier ashore, you never know how many others are going to follow him. Johnson confided to McNamara, I'm scared to death of putting ground forces in, but I'm more frightened about losing a bunch of planes from lack of security. As Dean Rusk, Secretary of State, explained on Face the Nation, the purpose of those Marines is to provide local close in security for the Marines who are already at Zanang. It is not their mission to engage in pacification operations. Rolling Thunder was planned to execute at the rate of one strike per week. The frequency and scale of the strikes scheduled to rise slowly over time. The bombing campaign began on March 2nd. 104 US and 19 South Vietnamese aircraft attacked an ammunition depot and the small naval base at Quan Ke. In a March 8th memo to the President, McGeorge Bundy reported that Two of the three of us think that chances of a turnaround in South Vietnam remain less than even. There remains a real question in our minds as to how much we should open the door to a readiness for talks. Sinkpack was disturbed by the delay between strikes and the assignment of insignificant targets. Ambassador Taylor shared their frustration. He was concerned that diplomatic efforts by the UK and France undermined the ability of the US to project a convincing signal that it was prepared to stick it out. It appears to me that to date, DRV leaders believe airstrikes at present levels are meaningless and that we are more susceptible to international pressure for negotiations. Taylor wanted to increase the tempo and intensity of airstrikes in southern North Vietnam to convince Hanoi that they faced progressively severe punishment. He was concerned that Rolling Thunder had instead been a few isolated thunderclaps. Rolling Thunder 6 also expended minimum effort. After initial delays, on March 15th, a combined US and South Vietnamese operation struck a weapons and radar installation on Tiger Island, 20 miles off the North Vietnamese coast, and an ammunition depot near Phu Quy in southern North Vietnam.
Army Chief of Staff Harold K. Johnson had been ordered to South Vietnam on March 2nd. President Johnson wanted him to examine the situation and advise him what had to be done. When he returned to brief the President on March 15th, he proposed an expansion of the air campaign against North Vietnam, a multinational force along the demilitarized zone, and the deployment of a US Army division near Saigon or in the Central Highlands north of the city. He had two specific proposals for rolling thunder. Increase the scope and tempo of US airstrikes against North Vietnam. The tempo of punitive airstrikes has been inadequate to convey a clear sense of US purpose to North Vietnam. He also recommended removing restrictions on the conduct of airstrikes against North Vietnam, which had reduced their effectiveness. President Johnson would ultimately approve most of his recommendations. Depots, lines of communications and air defence facilities were to be emphasised as future targets, and the requirement for concurrent US and South Vietnamese airstrikes was removed. General Johnson concluded that it would take 500,000 US troops five years to win the war, a conclusion that shocked both President Johnson and Secretary of Defence McNamara. The President consulted with the JCS on March 15th. Although he continued to delay a decision on the deployment of additional ground troops, he loosened restrictions on rolling thunder and charged the JCS with finding ways to improve the military situation in South Vietnam. On March 17th, Westmoreland requested a 2nd Marine Battalion, and two days later on March 19th, Admiral Grant Sharp, Sinkpack, requested a further battalion. The JCS urged the deployment of a Marine Division to the Northern Provinces, and an Army Division to the Central Highlands for offensive operations. This request was denied at a meeting at the White House on April 1st. However, the request for an additional Marine Battalion was approved, and the mission of the Marines was expanded from base security to active combat. Rolling Thunder 7 was authorised from March 19th to the 25th against five primary and alternate targets. One US and two South Vietnamese armed reconnaissance missions were also authorised. The purpose of armed reconnaissance missions was to overfly route segments of the transportation system and strike transport discovered. However, one mission a week, as authorised for Rolling Thunder 7, was insignificant. In the middle of March, Sharp prepared an interdiction plan for the JCS. The plan was an attempt to have more logical targets authorised, and as a limited attack plan, it was not intended to replace the stronger plans he and the JCS had submitted earlier. At that time, the JCS was concerned with the proposed large-scale deployment of US troops to South Vietnam, and with reaching a consensus on how the bombing campaign would develop. However, the prescribed parameters made it impossible for the JCS to propose a bombing campaign that they considered adequate. During the period March 26 to April 1st, Nine radar sites and three armed reconnaissance missions were authorised for Rolling Thunder 8, while the South Vietnamese were authorised to strike a barracks. Our opportunity has arrived. The 325th Division, the 320th Regiment and the 545th Viet Bank Battalion arrived in the highlands of South Vietnam in early 1965. After establishing base areas, the NVA units joined the Viet Cong in a winter-spring offensive battalion-sized NVA and main force VC operations. The offensive was directed from Hanoi by the Central Military Commission and the High Command of the Vietnam People's Army. In I Corps, the Communists strengthened their position in the foothills and moved further into the lowlands, isolating district and province capitals, and in Binh Dinh province they gained control over four districts, compelling Saigon to commit reserves. The coastal highway from Phu Yen to Quang Nai was blocked and Highway 19, connecting Pleiku and Con Nung to the coast, was cut. At the end of February, an airborne task force cleared the highway, destroying or scattering the communist forces in the area. Since the end of 1964, Group 125 had been transporting supplies to Military Region 5 along the northern and central coast of South Vietnam. Over 400 tonnes of supplies were delivered in January 1965 and the supply of heavy weapons accelerated. As a result of this increased supply, combined with smaller shipments through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, many main force Viet Cong units were supplied with AK-47 assault rifles and other communist bloc 7.62mm automatic and semi-automatic weapons, making possible communist victories during the winter-spring offensive. On February 15th, ship 143 of the North Vietnamese Navy, disguised as a commercial vessel, was sailing to Cochin, China with a shipment of arms. Receiving reports of trouble at its intended unloading area, the ship changed course and was camouflaged in Vung Ro Bay in northern South Vietnam. 
the ship was spotted by a passing US helicopter the next day, and after the communists were driven off, the ship was captured. 100 tons of weapons and supplies were discovered, almost all of the material manufactured in China or Eastern Europe. Westmoreland and the JCS then requested the US 7th Fleet block maritime infiltration operations. Operation Market Time devastated the supply route. From 1962 to 1965, approximately 5,000 tons of supplies had been delivered, but from March 1965 until the end of the war in 1975, less than 800 tons of cargo was delivered. Westmoreland, the JCS and Ambassador Taylor also wanted to mine or blockade harbours in North Vietnam, which would block 80% of Hanoi's trade. Most oil imports would then have to be imported by road or rail from China, and these routes could also be cut by destroying bridges. President Johnson refused to take these actions. His advisers had convinced him that communist forces in South Vietnam did not depend on external support, and he was concerned that damage to one of the many Soviet ships visiting Haiphong would provoke a reaction from Moscow. Hanoi had already stockpiled arms and ammunition in the South by February, and during February and March, the communist leadership had confirmed their plans. Can we defeat the Americans before they have time to change their strategy? Lei Zuan wrote to General Yan Chi Tang. I believe our opportunity has arrived. Missed Signals On January 9th, Mao told an American journalist that China's armies will not go beyond her borders to fight. Only if the United States attack China would we fight. Mao's comments and China's lukewarm response to flaming darts and rolling thunder alarmed Hanoi. Hanoi was afraid this attitude would encourage the US to bring its full weight to bear against North Vietnam. In a significant shift in Soviet policy, during the spring Hanoi received SA-2 surface-to-air missiles, jet aircraft and large quantities of ammunition and food. The Soviets also dispatched pilots and other specialists. But the Soviets were not the loyal allies they appeared to be. It was in Moscow's interest to deny Hanoi a decisive victory, because victory over South Vietnam would enhance China's power and prestige. An imminent North Vietnamese victory could also provoke a US reaction that might damage relations with the Soviet Union, or a war with China that, through the 1950 treaty between the two communist countries, might obligate Soviet assistance. At the start of the summer, a Soviet official in London confided to an American that the US should seal off the 17th parallel, cut off the Viet Cong, then ignore the North and wait for the Viet Cong to come to terms. However, these signals from the Soviet Union and China were not exploited by the Johnson administration. China was opposed to peace negotiations during this period, believing that peace proposals were a US-Soviet plot to limit the expansion of pro-Beijing communism. Beijing had also become afraid that North Vietnam, concerned by a lack of protection from China, might agree to a peace settlement that would undermine its position. However, Hanoi had no intention of reaching a peace agreement. Ironically, while doves in Washington believed US involvement in Vietnam was pushing the Soviet Union and China closer together, it was in fact driving them further apart. During late February and March, the position of China changed. The risks of involvement were low, rolling thunder was progressing slowly, and US ground forces were remaining within South Vietnam. Competition between China and the Soviet Union for influence in the communist bloc also encouraged the two countries to lavish support on North Vietnam. In November 1964, in a top secret letter, the Soviet ambassador to Hanoi reported that although the NLF had declared their wish to reunify the country peacefully, they were expanding military operations to increase their strength. Hanoi was confident Beijing would support its actions, and Moscow would have to do the same. On March 25th, two days after a Soviet offer to send volunteers to North Vietnam, China made its own offer. We are ready to send our men to fight together with the South Vietnamese people to annihilate the American aggressors. Lei Zuan responded on April 8th. We want some volunteer pilots, volunteer soldiers and other volunteers, including road and bridge engineering units. Ho and Mao met subsequently to define the details of the plan. Referring to the border between China and North Vietnam, Ho stated, We need China to help us build six roads from the border areas. We have 30,000 people building these roads. If China helps us, those people will be sent to the south. Mao agreed to provide seven divisions for road construction, and demonstrating his ambitions he added, Because we will fight large-scale battles in the future, it will be good if we also build roads to Thailand. Armament deliveries from China, including small arms, 
mortars and artillery would rise sharply in 1965. Hanoi doesn't play the game. At the 11th plenary session of the Laozong Central Committee in March, the leadership noted the divisions in the US. Despite its military strength, the US had weaknesses in the political area. An apparent contradiction between policy and strategy in Washington was viewed by many in the international community as neo-colonialism. It was noted that the military struggle was becoming more important, but the communists would continue both the military and political struggles. A presidential policy review was undertaken on April 1st. Ambassador Taylor believed the situation in Saigon had improved and that the upward trend would continue if increasing pressure was exerted on North Vietnam. However, he believed that Saigon was still incapable of providing strong leadership and Westmoreland was concerned about South Vietnam's ability to counter a summer offensive by the Viet Cong. The main point of the review concerned the prospect of the deployment of US and third country ground combat forces to South Vietnam. NSAM 328, completed on April 6, approved the deployment of two additional Marine battalions and a Marine Air Squadron. President Johnson also approved a change in the mission of the Marine battalions subject to conditions to be decided and approved by the Secretaries of Defence and State, while the gradual tempo of air operations in North Vietnam and Laos would continue. The effective intercept range of MiG aircraft would be avoided, targets would continue to be varied, attacks on lines of communications would be increased, and rail lines in the north and northeast of North Vietnam could possibly be attacked in a few weeks. The blockading or mining of North Vietnamese ports required further study to consider the political implications regarding the Soviets and other third parties. John McCone wrote a memo on April 2nd, which had a limited circulation to Secretary Rusk, Secretary McNamara, McGeorge Bundy and Ambassador Taylor. He had reported that previous strikes had not caused a change in North Vietnamese policy, and he did not believe the air operations outlined in the paper of April 1st would be sufficient to force Hanoi to change policy either. If we are to change the mission of the ground forces, we must also change the ground rules of the strikes against North Vietnam. We must strike their airfields, their petroleum resources, power stations and their military compounds. This must be done promptly and with minimum restraint. McComb believed that we can expect requirements for an ever-increasing commitment of US personnel without materially improving the chances of victory. We will find ourselves mired down in combat in the jungle in a military effort that we cannot win and from which we will have extreme difficulty extracting ourselves. McCone's opinions coincided precisely with those of Sharp and the JCS. The influential theorist of limited war, Robert Osgood, summarised the theory of graduated pressure as applied in Vietnam. In the spring of 1965, the American government put into effect a version of controlled escalation. But Hanoi did not play the game. Conclusion In November 1963, President Ngo Dinh Diem was overthrown in a military coup, not because South Vietnam was losing the war, but through State Department pressure in Saigon and Washington. With no replacement for Diem in sight, Hanoi took advantage of the turmoil in Saigon and intensified the war in the South, hoping to win a quick victory. Faced with a choice between taking decisive military action and withdrawal, in early 1965, President Johnson chose instead to compromise between the hawks and doves in Washington. Johnson's priority was maintaining political support for his Great Society program, and any disagreement with this consensus was not tolerated. CIA Director McCone and Vice President Hubert Humphrey were among those sidelined. This indecisive approach in Washington encouraged Hanoi to continue and intensify its efforts in the South, and with victory for North Vietnam now more likely, it also drove the Soviet Union and China to compete with each other in providing support to Hanoi. <laughs>